Our next legend for the morning is Renee Schwarzenbach, who essentially needs no introduction. Um, Renee is from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and is internationally recognized for his research in the fate and transport of environmental pollutants. And many of you probably know Renee from the classic textbook that he co-authored, Environmental Organic Chemistry. This textbook remains the most popular environmental chemistry book. It's on my shelf, probably on the shelf of, of a lot of people in this room. And it's used at numerous universities around the world. Renee has also been recognized by ISI as one of the most cited authors in the field of environmental organic chemistry, and he has served on the advisory board for the premier environmental journal, Environmental Science and Technology. Renee is also the 2006 winner of the ACS Award for Creative Advances in Environmental Science and Technology. And some of you probably know Renee from his long-standing association with the Gordon Research Conference on Environmental Sciences Water. In particular, Renee is known for his soccer abilities. I've seen him out there on the soccer field before with a lot of students, amazing. Um, and there's a rumor going around that he may be possibly on the secret committee of the Gordon Conference. So without further ado, Renee Schwarzenbach. Okay, that's fine. And how do I? No. Oh, I think I need the other one. And we need to get you. He knows. Oh yes. Switching to Mac. Okay, maybe I should can already start to thank Susan and Vic for inviting me. Uh, if somebody calls you a legend, one starts to feel pretty old. <laughs> Although when I heard the talk by Fred McLafferty yesterday, when I was a student, I attended a conference where he was already a legend. So this guy must be 150 years old, I, I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I would like to do here is uh, sort of a little bit of nostalgia and then show some of the things that we are doing right now and maybe point towards some things in the future. And I have sort of, now I need this. No, I need uh, your, but you have to put the thing in it. Ah, it's in it. Okay, uh, this is maybe a little bit small, but there has been a life before environmental chemistry in my life. And this was analytical chemistry, and I was one of these masochists in the late 60s, early 70s, who tried to sort of apply computer applications to analytical chemistry. I actually wrote a data acquisition program uh, for MassSpec, which when I finished my thesis, you could throw it in the, in, in, in the uh, wherever. Uh, and I was also part of this community who had the illusion that the computer can replace the brain. It strikes me like the people in life science these days have the same illusion, but uh, in systems biology and these kind of things. Okay, so this was uh, my life uh, before uh, environmental chemistry. What I will also do is give some f wise advice for newcomers maybe also for old comers. Uh, and I think uh, one is, and they might be trivial, but I'm gonna tell them anyway. Uh, don't plan your life, it's going to be different anyway. And actually, I was about to start a company in computer applications in analytical chemistry. And thanks to Max Bloomer, who was one of the pioneers in biogeochemistry, uh, oceanography, I didn't. I met him at the conference and he gave a talk about all these chemicals and the complexity of environmental chemistry and I was so fascinated uh, that I went to him after his talk and he invited me actually for dinner because he was originally Swiss who went to the United States, maybe also for other reasons, I don't know. And after dinner he uh, offered me a postdoc at Woods Hole, Oceanographic Institution. 
And I didn't know where Woodhull was, although Walter Giger, a colleague of mine, uh, has also spent a year there. So we looked it up at, on, the, on the map, my wife and I, and we decided to go. And that's how it started. My early volatile days, I would call them, because we were working on volatiles. And I want to acknowledge a few people that were important. One, of course, is Phil Schwendt, who happened to be the, one of the co-authors of, of, of our book, uh, and Oliver Zafirio, who has been uh, a person who I worked with. This is, does not work, but maybe I don't need it. Uh, then uh, Walter Giger, who ag hired me as a postdoc. Uh, uh, one legend hires another legend. That's pretty, a pretty legendary legend in the end. Uh, uh, John Westall, who uh, was also a postdoc at Eawag at that time, and Josef Zayer, uh, who taught me a lot of microbiology in these early days. Now, the most important person for many of us was, of course, Werner Stumm. And whoever, I don't know how many of you have written a paper with Werner Stumm. <laughs> Charlie, and you survived maybe two papers. I only survived one paper. Uh, he fired me every other day, and then he hired, hired me again because we didn't agree on many things. But he has been very pivotal because he sort of uh, made me get into a field which uh, we afterwards, he, he called it chemodynamics because he had read the book by Thibodeau. And uh, so he was the one started me, uh, who started me on this uh, field, more or less. Uh, and as a parenthesis, you can see down here, uh, we have published uh, our only paper in science. Uh, and I always uh, say environmental chemists do not publish in science. And I talked to an editor one time, and he said, yeah, there is no editor for environmental chemistry. But maybe that's good for environmental science and technology, that science doesn't publish a lot of environmental chemistry. So this journal can benefit uh, from it. OK, here is the world according to an environmental organic chemistry. The artist is Thomas Hofstetter here. Of course, there are all these partitioning processes that Don Mackay has been talking about. And actually, we have worked in all these fields, and I'm going to touch on that uh, a little bit later. Uh, of course, all the degradation processes. So you have to deal with all these different processes. But the key is, of course, that you then choose an appropriate model to put everything together, to marry all the different processes with transport, uh, mixing, and, and, and transfer uh, processes. And the key here is, of course, uh, that you get the, and Don already said that, that you get the model of, that has the right complexity. Because the strength of the model is, uh, the model is as strong as its weakest part. That's an arbitrary comment. But some people sometimes uh, forget. Uh, so on the right here, that, how do I do this? Aha, uh -huh, it's the other way, huh? OK. <laughs> I tried to kill myself with a laser here. <laughs> OK, this is sort of the engineers, I would say, because they have to uh, find uh, easy solutions. And this is maybe all the real chemists. So the art is, of course, to somehow be in between. And I think, and this is really, I, I strongly believe in it, that if you want to use simple models, you better understand the processes that you are modeling. And unfortunately, it's sometimes it's not the case. OK, here is the book. I would like to acknowledge Dieter Imboden and Phil Quent and uh, my secretary, who has suffered a lot because this monster here has been uh, made camera ready. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do a camera ready book. OK, and I heard that there is a black market for the first version because the second version apparently Apparently, is, is a monster, but, but uh, maybe there is threat of a third version at some point. OK, and here I just want, don't want to read the whole thing. We sort of laid out this world that we wanted sort of to describe, which is look at the structure of a chemical and then learn or, or get from the structure how the chemical is going to behave in the environment. This is something that I think we have to teach the, the students. And the beauty of environmental chemistry is, of course, that on the one time, it's the whole chemistry with analytical chemistry. 
That's given. You have to know that. On the other hand, you have to understand the environment, the dynamics of the environment, and that's the challenge to do these both sides. And when we go along, I will dwell on that uh, a little bit. Okay, now uh, let me give tribute to some of the important people that have played a, a role in my scientific life. Now, if you want to do very uh, sort of full studies, very consistent, very uh, broad, you have to get Germans. <laughs> they are best at it. Are there any Germans here? I'm sorry. For <laughs> that's the obvious one. <laughs> okay, these are the Germans in my family, uh, and they are still, uh, still, uh, still around, of course. They are not. Maybe on the way to legends, hopefully, there is Stefan Hardelein, who has worked with me on sorption and redox. There is the Arteisha on uh, toxicology, actually, member in water partitioning. Kai Uegos, who I will talk about, some of his work. And there is our new German, this is Michael Sander. We have got into sorption, I'm not going to talk about that, sorption of proteins, DNA, and so on, which is a completely different ballgame. So fugacity, there is no hope, Don, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> also, nanoparticles are not going to have a fugacity. Okay, uh, these are the smiley guys, these are the Swiss, the German, Germans usually look a little bit more, more serious. There is Stefan Müller and Michael Berg. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, field studies, analytical chemistry. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, Thomas Hofstetter, he is still with me, and he, uh, I will talk about this a little bit later. And there is Katrin Fenner. She is doing chemical risk assessment modeling. Her specialty is to include metabolites into these uh, risk assessment models. And what she is doing, she is uh, predicting biodegradation and then look with high resolution mass spec whether these chemicals are actually there. So this is something that I'm also not going to talk about. And then I would also like to thank to 35 InnoSphere PhD students. These are the closer ones, and there are some that are a little bit out, out there. And then 200 InnoSphere and AutoSphere co-authors. So when you work in a field like uh, environmental chemistry, it's so interdisciplinary that you end up to have a lot of co-authors, and that's another joy, I think, to work together with so many, many people. Okay, topic number one, which I'm going to dwell on, is 30 plus years of sorption partitioning, a never-ending story. <laughs> it's like fugacity, it's a never-ending ending story. And it started sort of at our Gordon Research Com Conference in 1980. And there I met some environmental engineers. There is Don McKay. There is Dominic de Toro. Uh, and at that time, there was this model uh, sort of relating logarithm of uh, natural organic matter water partition constant to log KOV. And they found a slope of one. <laughs> and it was EPA approved, so you couldn't do anything about it. Uh, for the young people, if you want to start a career, have a controversy controversy with some of the already halfway legends because the Swiss slope was 0.72. And about a year later, Don Mackay wrote me, it's not 1.0, it's 0.9375. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing there was that uh, uh, Don Mackay ordered me to go to his dormitory, not what you think now, but to teach me that the slope is actually 1. And I wasn't convinced, so uh, we went on. And this is maybe another important thing, uh, that if you find good correlations between experimental data, this doesn't mean that you have found a theory. And that was the belief, and still is the belief, uh, uh, for many people. OK, so let's go to the most simple case, and we actually talk about fugacity. And what I would like to show is that we should get rid of the octal water partition coefficient there is Don McKay, uh, and that maybe there is a better way of dealing with this. So when you want to calculate fugacity, or whenever, I mean fugacity is just another expression of how chemicals distribute between a media and air, or a gas phase. Uh, if you want to uh, model that or to address that, you deal with two things. You deal on the one hand with the complexity of all these chemicals, with all these structural moiety, 
And on the other hand, you deal with all the properties of the matrices out there where, people, where uh, compounds can distribute to or absorb to. So in order to bring this all together, you have to use a little bit more sophisticated model. It's still very simple. So when we think about uh, the energies involved of uh, distributing chemicals between the gas phase, and that's the most simple case because in the gas phase there are no interactions. If we uh, deal with ideal gases at this dilution to a surface, we, also, we only have to sort of uh, deal with the interactions of the surface with the chemical. So the free energy gain from interactions with the surface. When we go into a bulk phase, it's a little bit more difficult. We have to make a cavity, so this requires energy. Then we put the molecule in, and then you get some interactions back. But that's about it. Okay, let's start with an absorption model. Oh, let me see. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the gospel. Caio Vegos, who joined me about 10 years ago. Uh, maybe here I should make a comment. Usually one thinks one goes out there and hires people. That's not the case. People sort of find you. <laughs> and Caio Vegos was, was, was one of them and a very fortunate one. He wrote me that he would like to make a postdoc with me and that he has money from an organ European organization called Eero. Now he came, but Eero got bankrupt, so there was no money. <laughs> so we had to pay him, but it was very fortunate. Now he has been uh, promoting this polyparameter linear free energy relationship that are based uh, on Abraham, that's not the one of, from the Bible, but he is already a legend also. Uh, Abraham, who sits somewhere in England. Now the abs adsorption, and we talk about adsorption first and then absorption uh, from the gas phase. So all you need to do is to know, to, to sort of quantify Van der Waals interactions. So you need to know the, the Van der Waals uh, property of the compound and of the surface and electron donor, electron acceptor interaction surface and, uh, and compound. That's it. Okay, what you do then, you take a lot of simple chemicals which have only Van der Waals, Van der Waals electron donor, or Van der Waals electron donor and electron acceptor uh, properties. And you measure a lot of partition constants with the medium that you are interested in. And what you can do then is sort of from the equation, if you know the compound parameter, you can get the surface parameter. So this is just illustrated here for, for various minerals, uh, calcium carbonate, aluminum oxide, and so on. Talc is one of them as a function of relative humidity. Now the problem is that the properties of surfaces in the environment change with environmental parameters like humidity if we look at mineral uh, surfaces. The interesting thing here is uh, maybe two things. Teflon is the poorest and graphite is the uh, has the highest Van der Waals uh, property, all, everything per square meter. And this is a logarithmic scale, so there is a big difference between these properties. So if you take, for example, kaolinite, uh, at very low relative humidity, it has a much higher Van der Waals uh, surface energy than, than uh, at higher uh, uh, relative humidity. The nice thing here that you see is that if you approach 90% relative humidity, the chemicals see a bulk water surface. That's what this data tells you. So using all these organic chemicals, you can actually probe for the properties of the surface uh, that, that you're interested in. What you then can do, or this is maybe an illustration why simple models don't work. Uh, this is our 1,500 data points from 50 compounds, 12 surfaces, different relative humidities plotted against vapor pressure, not even the most courageous EPA person <laughs> would probably put a line through that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, with a lot of scale. Hmm? <laughs> okay, with a polyparameter uh, approach, you can do a pretty good job. So that's pretty convincing. But let's go further on. It's, it becomes even more convincing, I guess. You can calibrate your model with a, uh, with, wa with a water surface. I'm not going to go into detail. And then you get the model, you get the coefficients for the, from the, for the model. 
Now you have a unifying model. It should work for all surfaces if you know the surface properties, if you know the compound properties. It's calibrated with water. Whereas the strongest electron donor, electron acceptor property. So it's pretty good to use that as calibration. And indeed, uh, one of our students has published this uh, look at the adsorption of compounds from air to a quartz surface. This is the model. These are the parameters for the surface. Uh, for the su these are the surface parameters. This is experimental and this is predicted. This is not fitted. This is predicted. So that looks reasonably promising. Let's go to a little bit more complex case, and that's the air natural organic matter partitioning. So the interest here was to see how does natural organic matter differ from different sources with respect to desorption properties. All these measurements are done by inverse gas chromatography. For those who know that, that's used in material sciences. So you just put your stuff into a column. You uh, measure the retention times of your compounds, and you're interested in the properties of your stationary phase. Okay, here you need a model which is a little bit more complicated. Let's go back here. Uh, you need cavity formation, as I said, Van der Waals interaction, electron, ac electron acceptor. There is a term which is not really very well understood, especially when you deal with water as a solvent, is sort of the interaction with your molecules and the solvent molecules with respect to polarization, uh, uh, polarizing each other. Okay. Here is a, for Leonard, humic acid. This is work of, of Christian Nieder, who has been a graduate student with us. This is experimental log humic acid air against octanol air. And for the apolar compounds, this works very good. This was the seducing part 20 years ago, because for apolar compounds, they don't really care in what kind of organic matter they are partitioning. So that's why it works for the polar guys. It doesn't work anymore. There are like six orders of magnitude uh, difference for the same uh, sort of six order of magnitude difference in octanol air for almost the same uh, humic acid air partition coefficient. Okay, if you do a polyparameter uh, approach, it looks much better. And this is the kind of equation you get. I don't want to go into all, all these equations, so I, I'm. I'm showing you now visually the comparison of 10 different humic and fulvic acids, how the partitioning looks like. And the leonardite humic acid is going to be our reference. Okay, and there is an interesting result uh, now. We know from literature that KOC values or KOM values or however you want to call them may differ by an order of magnitude when you go from one organic matter uh, to another. Now the question is, do they have so different electron donor uh, acceptor properties, or is the capacity or what's available for, uh, to, to sorb, uh, is this different? What we see here is that we have an Amherst, Aldrich, and the peat humic acid, which are very similar to Leonardite. If you go into more aquatic humic acid river, and if you go into fulvic acid, you get a deviation, but it's sort of parallel to our reference humic acid, which means that primarily it's the capacity of the humic acid to sorb, and it's not, if you look at the coefficients, the individual coefficients for van der Waals and, and, and hydrogen uh, donor and acceptor properties. And this is where you sort of get this one order of magnitude difference. Now, the good news here is if you look at sort of the terrestrial part, you are a factor of three. That's fine. That's for, for unique world approaches. That's, that's pretty good. So for one, could, one could here sort of derive an equation, and Christian Nieder has done this, for, for example, soil organic matter, and use it, I think, in a much better way than using these octanol water relationships where you have to have 20 equations uh, for, for each compound class. This is only one. And this is how all these 10 uh, humic acid, octanol, uh, and natural organic matter air partition coefficients collapse, and you lose a, a, a polyparameter uh, equation. 
So this approach is applicable and it's able to account for sorbate as well as sorbent vari variability. End of the commercial. Now, where are we going now? Uh, I think the next, the next part now is to get, and this is the tricky part, to get the compound properties of complex molecules. They are uh, multifunctional complex molecules. And this has been done by another graduate student of us in cooperation with Katrin and Kai Regos uh, to determine these uh, linear free energy relation or solvation energy uh, relationship parameters for 76 uh, pesticides and pharmaceuticals. This test has come out uh, this year. It's uh, shortly said, or briefly, uh, eight different chromatographic columns where you look at the retention times. Now it's water, ethanol, uh, methanol mixtures, partitioning, and then you can derive uh, these parameters. If you use whatever you can get the stationary phase from a very apolar to a very uh, polar phase. Okay, let's switch to topic two. Okay, topic two is 20 years of redox reactions. So we're going from partitioning now to electron transfer reactions, which play a very important role in the fate of organic pollutants in the environment. And I call this the nitroaromatic story because we use, we use nitroaromatic compounds as probe molecules to sort of see what is going on in complex in environments. Now, nitroaromatics are, of course, important uh, environmental compounds also, explosive pesticides and so on. There are enormous uh, contaminations with these kind of compounds, especially explosives if you look at all these sites of, the, of all these armies around the world. Unfortunately, there are these sites. Okay, what we have been doing is uh, using a set of compounds, and this is what happens to an aromatic compounds. It sort of acquires a series of electrons to be transformed finally into an aniline. So what you can do is you can get compounds which are differently substituted with, uh, subs uh, with different substituents, which have very different one electron reduction potentials, which means that the thermodynamic entity sort of how easy it is to put an electron onto the nitroaromatic compounds. So that's a property which will tell you uh, how well uh, the compound will acquire an, an electron. And by doing that, by simple compounds, we can span a range of about 300, almost, over almost 300 uh, millivolt, which means about uh, five orders uh, of magnitude relative rates if, it is, if, if the transfer if the reduction rate would be directly proportional uh, to the one electron reduction potential. Okay, this is sort of a busy slide, but it shows what we have been interested in for the last 10 years. We are interested in biogeochemical cycles on the one time mostly involving iron and natural organic matter. And on the other hand, we are interested in the reduction of pollutants. Like nitroaromatic compounds, we also have done quite a lot of work with dehalogenation of halogenated compounds. So the systems that we are interested in is on the one hand is uh, iron adsorbed to surfaces or built into minerals, structural iron in clay minerals, and the role of these irons in transporting electrons from iron to, to uh, the nitroaromatic compounds or the halogenated compounds. Uh, regeneration of this iron might be by just absorbing iron to that surround or by uh, microbes uh, who uh, oxidize organic material. The engineering part behind it is to sort of get rid of one material by oxidizing it and get rid of the other one because that's the first step in remediation that can be reduced. So you get a reactor that's taking care of two kinds of pollutants at the same time, and the microbes are happy because they get iron too all the time. Uh, and the same thing with natural organic matter. Uh, so what we have been doing is a lot of model studies uh, in the laboratory with surface-bound iron, structural iron, and with dissolved iron species in collaboration also with other people. Now, if you look at the kinetics of these uh, uh, 
abiotic reactions of, of, of uh, nitroaromatic compounds. It's very, it looks, it's first order and you get aniline, very nice mass balance. In other cases, first order but almost no aniline. The red one is the aniline. So you get intermediates. An interesting part is the structural iron in reduced clays. It's sort of biphasic. It's a fast reaction in the beginning and then a slow reaction afterwards, which in the meantime, we have tried to elucidate with a group in France doing infrared spectroscopy to see, uh, and that uh, what's hypothesized is that you, in the clay you have iron 2, O, iron 2, and iron 2, O, iron 3 species, and the one are more reactive than the others. And that would sort of account for this biphasic behavior. Okay, now here comes the nightmare for EPA, or the Swiss Protection Agency. If you take these 10 compounds, if you look at their relative rates, and this is data from the last millennium, old data. <laughs> there is also data from uh, this millennium. There is going to be a paper in 2009 uh, dealing with these, these clay minerals. Uh, but in principle, the important message here is uh, if you take these old species like uh, natural organic matter, quinone type things, you get a correlation between the relative rate logarithmic to the one electron reduction potential with a slope of one. Which means that the fastest one here and the slowest one react relative to each other with a, a difference of 10 to the fourth. If you take iron species, there is no real correlation, although there is a dotted line here. These are the author substituents. Only maybe a factor of 10 to the, this is 10 to the 5th actually, 10 to the uh, 3. If you look at them in an aquifer sediment, everybody reacts at the same rate. So how can you predict what's going to happen with these compounds from the laboratory? That's usually the problem that we have. We do a lot of things in the laboratory and then we have to scale up somewhere in the field. That's also the beauty of the whole thing. Okay, so what do we do? In order, in the field, to maybe get a handle on what the rates are. And this is a case, and it has been the same thing with many other fields that we have been in. Uh, you sort of stick to the same topic, and then at some point, and you enjoy it. And then are the tribulations, you can't get further. And suddenly there are, is a new method where you can look at things and then you return back and, and, and look at uh, your problems uh, uh, with these new tools. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, in the second part now is compound-specific stable isot isotope analysis to get a handle on degradation in the field. But I'm going to talk about lab experiments because that's what you have to understand first, what is actually and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at mostly, again, the de reduction of nitroaromatic compounds and of, uh, with iron species and with natural organic matter. We also have done some photochemistry, but I'm not going to dwell on, on that. This is actually coming out or has come out in es and and it's the first time I think that somebody has looked at uh, at least nitrogen fractionation during photochemical reactions, so sort of pioneering. Okay, now, and I make this wise statement at the end. If you live in paradise, like we do in Switzerland, and if you move from one institution to the other, as I did from Airlock to ETH, I went to the president of ETH, and I said, if I move, I need to get some money, because I need to sort of set up a new instrumentation. And he gave me half a million Swiss francs, which is almost half a million dollars now, to buy this instrument, which is a stable isotope, uh, ratio mass spectrometer, which happens to be half a million. Well, it's a very stupid mass spectrometer. It only measures isotope ratios, but extremely precisely. So what you can, this is uh, just a, 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 uh, an illustration of it for those who are not that familiar with it. So you might recall that uh, uh, isotopes of carbon, C13 to C12, is about 1.12 percent, okay? But most carbons have that, and they differ back here. 
so that the instrument has to be able to measure these differences. And if it measures this kind of difference, this is one per mil differences. And this is how isotope ratios are expressed. Now commonly, for organic compounds, uh, hydrogen and carbon, by far carbon has been used, as well because it's the easiest uh, to measure. And we have been fortunate to be sort of being able to pioneer on measuring N15, N14 on single organic compounds. One has done this on nitrogen and bulk organic matter for a long time. But with the GC, uh, separate the compounds and measure the N15, N14 ratio uh, on the individual compound. So we have a tool now to look at the reduction of nitro uh, aromatic compounds, which we would not be able if we wouldn't look at the nitrogen. Okay, here is an example. This is the reduction of nitrochlorobenzene. This is anilin, this mass balance, fantastic. And what you can see is, this is where the ratio of N15 to N14 uh, starts in per mil, and this is how it gets enriched. And you see that the anilin product gets, at the end, when you're done with the reaction, has the same signature as in the beginning. So mass balance and isotope ratio balance is perfect in this. In this. Uh, and then what you can do is you can plot the fraction remaining in the solution when the reaction goes on to the, to the isotope signature. If you get a straight line, you know it's Rayleigh behavior, as one says. And the slope, these 30 percent, these 30 per mil, tell you that every time you uh, sort of proceed in your reaction by a factor of E, 2.7, you get an enrichment of 30 per mil in the element that you are looking at. This is, this is all what it says. Now, if you have this uh, fractionation factor, you can then, I'm not going to go into the details, you can then, when you analyze at a certain time or, or a certain, uh, a certain uh, location in the field, and if everything is perfect, I'm, I can make a statement afterwards about it, you can get from, if you know this, epsilon, and if it's constant, sort of, if it's not varying a lot, you can get a, you can get a fraction of the reacted subset, so you can calculate back how much of this stuff has been transformed when you know the initial signature of the, of the source material. It's a wonderful tool, if the field is not very complicated, because there is transport mechanisms, there are all kinds of things. Now, the nice thing about this fractionation, maybe I have to go back, is that significant fractionation occurs only if in a rate-determining step a chemical bond is broken. So sorption, partitioning, transport does very little compared to the 30 per mil, that is maybe one or two per mil uh, in, in this case. So if you have uh, significant fractionation, you know something uh, or some bond has probably uh, been broken. So the question then is, how much does this fractionation factor or enrichment factor vary when you put the nitroaromatic compounds in a very different environment? If you let them react with natural organic metal, if you let them react with iron, which is absorbed to an iron oxide surface, whether you let it react with iron that's sitting in a chlorine. But the hope is that it's not going to be very different. Uh, and at first, these are the three papers, it looked very, very, very promising. So in most of the systems here, the fractionation factor, this is sort of the inverse, it tells you, uh, 1.04 tells you, that the compound carrying a nitrogen 14 reacts 1.04 times faster than the compound carrying a nitrogen 15. So that's what it tells you. Okay, and you see in all these systems, very constant, not much variability in uh, the uh, enrichment factor, independent of the substituent. Okay, this question was, of course, uh, uh, asked to Chris Kramer, who is a molecular modeler, who does quant mechanical modeling, and together with Bill Arnold, who he was both at the University 
uh, of Minnesota, Bill Arnold was on a sabbatical leave, so Thomas Hofstetter and Bill Arnold started to calculate whether uh, they would expect a, an, an influence of the substituent on the fractionation factor and what the magnitude of the fractionation factor would be. And of course, not of course, luckily or whatever, uh, it right fits in there. So we should have stopped to do the experiments at that point because the bad surprise uh, comes then. Uh, some experiments in aqueous solution at different pHs, only in aqueous solution, not with the surface species. Uh, in aqueous solution, this fractionation factor, if you increase the pH, went down and leveled off at the, at the fraction, at the, an, an apparent kinetic isotope effect of 1.01. .01. So what do you do, do you do with this? Uh, long story, short summary. There are two pathways, actually, uh, when you look at nitroaromatic reduction. One is uh, when you first have an electron, then a proton, and then the second electron. What this means is the fractionation or the rate determining step is an O-bond cleavage. And that's the 1.04 you also calculate. In another case, if there are not many protons, for those nitroaromatic compounds who are weak bases, like dinitro compounds, there is a pH effect. And you sort of go another pathway, an electron, electron, and then proton. And then the rate determining and fractionating step is the actual electron transfer to the compound which Chris Kramer and Al et al. calculated to be about 1.01 .01 using Markov theory. So it fits. But what we are left with as an environmental chemist is, OK, at maximum we have 1.04. At minimum we have 1.01. .01. And depending on conditions, it might be somewhere in between. So that's the bad news <laughs> or sort of the tribulation. But at least we understand uh, the system whatever it's good for. Last example. Uh, and this is sort of advocating two that, that you use several elements uh, to uh, sort of look at more complicated cases. I go to that very quickly. It's again uh, degradation of nitroaromatic compounds, but this time by bacteria under oxidative conditions. There are two pathways. One pathway is hydroxylation with a dioxygenase breakdown. The other one is first reduction. And this is our old example. Now what you then see is if you look at carbon and nitrogen, small carbon fractionation, uh, a significant carbon fractionation, no nitrogen fractionation, secondary effect, 30, we know 27 in this case, which very much matches this. What you then can do, of course, is in the field when you see that, and I'm uh, just doing this very fast, you can plot the nitrogen versus, versus carbon uh, signature, and you can see the blue line would be degradation via this pathway, the red line would be by degradation like this way, right, right, uh, way. and if you have mixtures of it, you could have cal calculate uh, what is the percentage of which pathway. Okay. To finish up, some more very personal, biographically biased, wise advice for newcomers. OK, pick a community when you start your career, or if you want to leave it and, and start a new career, uh, in which people care more about the scientific issues than about their personal careers. And I'm very happy that I chose the environmental community. Because if I look at what's going on in life science, or chemistry, maybe you don't want to be there. <laughs> be happy with the environmental community. And do whatever you do with passion, which maybe it's trivial. Now, this is very difficult, of course, and I'm talking from a Swiss perspective. Pick a university institution that provides you with enough financial support to hire people on the spot and to work on topics that you cannot yet get funded elsewhere. We talk about rejection of papers, rejection of, if you want to do new stuff, 
you have to got money from somewhere and because it's a vicious circle. And uh, another thing which I think is very important, I mean, this is how things usually work. You have a project, you advertise for a position, people apply, and you have to wait, and the best people might be somewhere else. If you meet somebody, like I met Michael Sander at the Gordon Conference two, two years ago, not this one, I hired him on the soccer field because he's a good soccer player. He's also an excellent scientist. That's a difficult one, huh? <laughs> especially for the legends, because they think they are the best. Uh, hire or seek collaboration with people who are better than you. It's going to make all the difference. And I know what I'm talking about. Stick sufficiently long to a topic in order to leave a footprint. That's another thing which I think is sort of a little bit of disease these days because of lack of money. People have to change fields sometimes, which makes life a little bit more difficult. Now something for Jerry. <laughs> you know that already. I said it at the Gordon Conference. <laughs> Publish whole stories, or at least as whole as the journals or your promotion committee allows you. There is a pollution of literature right now. Too many papers with too, many con too little content. Mind. Fight page limits if you have something substantial to say. Jerry, did you not hear the game? Okay, and write your publication in the most didactic way possible. I think that's another important uh, message. But the most important one is this one. Don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>